Have you ever thought about the foundation and background success of most first world countries with their beautiful infrastructures, thriving businesses, and explosive agrarian activities? Take China, London, and New York for example. What do all of these cities have in common you may ask? Well, it turns out, all of their triumphs or fiascos, economic explosions or downfalls, even population increase or food crisis might soon be influenced by the nation of Morocco. Perhaps not for the reasons that you might consider, but sooner than later, this future economic progression was probably defined by a tiny little creature a few centuries ago. Wondering what creature that might be? This creature is the bat. Yes, you got that right, the bat. We consider bats as things that both regulate insect populations, as well as creatures that spread uncommon diseases. However, a couple of hundred years ago, bats were discovered to do something more. Something phenomenal that would shape our world forever without most people recognizing the change. In 1802, European explorer Alexander von Humboldt was traveling through the Peruvian lands when he unearthed a miraculously strange discovery. The thing is, the Peruvian lands never looked like they were suitable for large-scale agriculture, but yet their fields were filled with fresh healthy and blooming crops. He tried to find out the reason for this, and that is when he made his discovery. He quickly learned that the Peruvian people had been gathering a substance called guano. Guano is the defecation of bats and some seabirds, and the Peruvians were using this to spread along with their crops for several thousand years. Alexander studied this technique in agricultural improvements and brought this knowledge of guano back to Europe significantly increasing food production. No sooner than he had brought it to his home country, this knowledge became a vital point of attention to the Western world. This discovery of guano was luring other nations because food production grew in the United States and Europe, and all of a sudden these Western nations went from having a minor shortage of food to having an enormous surplus of food which was more than enough to feed all of its citizens and extra people. In fact, guano's impact on boosting food production became a big deal, so much so that several wars were fought over guano, like the Chinchilla Islands War of 1864 and the War of the Pacific in 1879. The United States became so infatuated with guano that it passed the Guano Islands Act, which permitted any American citizen to claim and annex any island that had any substantial amount of guano on it and as expected they did lay claim to approximately 70 of such islands, mostly in the Pacific Ocean area. You see, guano became so essential to the economic population and industrial growth of the Western world and perhaps became the most vital resource in the entire world. However, in 1913, Fritz Haber discovered an innovative formula to manufacture an artificial version of guano that we call fertilizer today. Yes, he did in this one event, the discovery of fertilizer became a pivotal turning point in the explosion of the world's population which became known as the detonator. Shortly after this innovation, starvation in nations that used fertilizer became rarer, and the world's population boomed from 1.6 billion to 7.7 billion over the next 100 years. Food production and crop harvests instantly doubled in many towns that used fertilizer. Many nations with typically incongruous locations for agriculture like the northern European countries such as Norway, all of a sudden were able to sustainably grow crops in more areas as well. Eventually, every single country's economic and population growth was indirectly grown by the food surplus created from the used fertilizer. In fact, it is projected that roughly 50% of all nitrogen in your body is directly from fertilizer that farms use to produce food. Well, enough about history. How does this invention affect us today? Fertilizer has permitted many countries to grow and in some cases become superpowers of the world where nearly all of their citizens are well-fed and have very little food insecurity. But in 2010, some scientists began noticing something disturbing. The compound responsible for a ton of the growth that humanity has witnessed over the last two centuries might actually be running out. That's because our fertilizer which has grown our entire civilization over the last hundred years needs three things. If you are still watching this video, it means you love watching content around African development. If you do, then do us a favor and hit that thumbs up button. It helps us grow and helps more people see our videos. Have you done that? Let's move on. The very first of which is a nitrogen-based compound, the second is phosphate, and the third is a potassium-based compound. 
Interestingly, two of these compounds, phosphate and potassium, or in their raw form potash, we cannot create from scratch. You see, potash is a non-renewable resource that is largely controlled by just four countries. Canada is by far the world's largest producer of potash, with over one-third of the world's potash coming from Canada. Russia, Belarus, and China produced between 10 and 20 percent of the world's potash, while each and every other nation in the world collectively produces only about 19 percent of the world's potash. Let's reflect on that for a second. Essentially, four countries control one ingredient that will dictate who is or isn't allowed to produce fertilizer. As potash resources are being depleted in these countries, potash will become a more prized resource as the world's population continues to grow in relation to food requirements. Now, the world isn't likely going to go through a potash shortage in the next hundred years or so. Matter of fact, our potash reserves could last for several hundred years before any shortages. However, phosphate, one of those three key ingredients, is an absolutely different case. Since 2010, there has been a fiercely contested debate about when, other than if the world will run out of phosphate reserves. According to the United States Geological Survey, it was estimated that we currently have 260 years worth of phosphate left on the Earth, supposing that the population doesn't increase again. Also assuming that the population continues to grow at a similar rate to what it is today, we have approximately just over 100 years of phosphate left on the Earth. However, those are just estimated that number could be much lower or much higher. But really, we don't even need to know when the world will run out of phosphate because we are already experiencing shortages and have witnessed many countries take dire economic policies to guard their own phosphate. For example, phosphate prices have increased by roughly 80% since early 2020, and in September of 2021, China banned exporting any of its own phosphates in hopes of maintaining enough phosphate to produce enough fertilizer to grow its own food for the foreseeable future. But there is one key piece of the puzzle I left out until this point. You see, China has the second largest phosphate reserves in the world as it owns roughly 5% of the world's phosphate. Despite being the second largest phosphate reserve in the world, keep in mind that it is already concerned about its phosphate supply. Syria has the third largest amount of phosphate at 3%, Algeria is next at just under 3%, and the rest of the world has only 2% or less each per country in terms of the world's phosphate reserves. But then at number one, there is the country of Morocco. You see, Morocco owns a massive 70% of the world's phosphate, and let's ponder about that for a second. One nation owns 70% of a resource that can determine which other nations will be able to feed their populations. In fact, within the next decades, the world's food supply could become reliant upon whoever Morocco chooses to trade with or who they choose not to trade with, just maybe Morocco might just sell off the phosphate to the highest bidder. There is also the potential for international conflict or cooperation, as that has been seen throughout history with any valuable resource. And this would be far from the first time that we have seen wars started or partnerships endorsed that revolved around the acquisition of fertilizer. In fact, increasingly every single year. Largely populated countries like India, Mexico, and Brazil are becoming even more dependent upon Moroccan phosphate or their agricultural industries. And other nations like the United States have been placing tariffs on Moroccan phosphate. Now it is worth revealing that peak phosphorus, as some are calling this predicament, may not happen as soon as we think. As stated earlier, estimates range from seeing significant shortages relatively soon to seeing shortages that occur several hundred years from now. But this peak phosphorus mentality is really quite similar to what people were saying about oil in the 1950 because back then, many scientists presumed that oil production and reserves would peak around the year 1970. Yet, the world keeps discovering substantially more oil in places like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Norway, Iran, and China. There were also technological innovations for oil like fracking, which allowed the extraction of oil deposits that were previously seen as unextractable because of how difficult it was to extract the oil. What all this means is that even though it is predicted that rock phosphates will become significantly dwindle over the next several decades, we can't really know for sure. Also, scientists have begun genetically engineering plants to absorb considerably more phosphorus in natural soil to curb and dodge the dependence on fertilizer. So far, 
Those experiments have seen minor successes, but at the end of the day, the entire world might bore its fertilizer, something that has never been seen before in the history of the world. All of those old superpowers that owned a large percentage of the world's resources, like the United States, had with oil over 100 years ago, or as the British Empire had with metals in the early 19th century, or same with the Dutch East India Company of the 1600s or the Hudson's Bay Company in the late 1600s. All of these monopolies could thin out in comparison to Morocco's monopoly on phosphates in the world's fertilizer. It is also worth mentioning that part of Morocco's phosphate reserves are currently in an occupation zone in Western Sahara, meaning that a lot of those deposits are already in a conflict zone, which could be a sign of things to come. Now, if you enjoyed this video, you may as well like, comment, and hit the bell notification to get notified about our new videos. So just stay tuned and I'll be back very soon. And if you just watched this video but haven't subscribed yet, please tap that subscribe button for more interesting content. That's it for today guys, I'll see you guys in my next video.